Good morning, Eagles Wings. It's good to have everyone here this morning. God bless you. It's good to have uh, our visitors and our friends that can finally make it um, on uh, on a work day that uh, is normal for them. Uh, good to have you here. It's good to have you here. God bless you. It's good to have you here. Um, we had um, just some wonderful songs in praise and worship, and um, it was just very cool. Um, if you didn't feel the presence of the Lord, well, I'm sorry, I did. It felt like he was holding my hands again. So um, I know he's here. He's here in power. He's here in authority. And he is here to do, like they say, a thing. He's going to do a thing, okay? Today we're going to be using our theme text out of Psalm 91. And the name of this message is, Where is Your Dwelling Place? Now, in the course of our lives, we all have to live somewhere. Do we live in a shack? Do we live in a mansion? Or do we live in a home in the suburb somewhere? But the question really is, what are the conditions in our dwelling? What are the conditions in our home? Is it full of peace and tranquility? Or is it full of chaos and drama? We hate that. Is it full of violence and addiction? Or is it full of experimentation with drugs, drinking, sex, alternative lifestyles, or belief systems that don't align themselves with the Word of God? And then what are we to do in our dwelling place, in our homes, in our lives? Are we to endure a place where peace has no place and tranquility has no room? Are we just supposed to put up with that? Do we just tolerate a seemingly infinite amount of chaos and drama that fills our home or our lives? Do we just put up with that? No, we don't put up with that. What are we to do? Do we continue to enable violence? And I've heard this personally with my own ears. Oh, they really didn't mean to do that. They didn't mean to hurt me. They really loved me. Oh, really? And why did they put their hands on you in the first place? That's not love. That's not laying on of hands. That's laying on a fist. So come on, wake up, folks. Shake yourself awake. That's not love. That's not even an indicator of love. There's no room in your life for that kind of thing. So we think that we have to wink at addiction because those that are addiction will say, oh, we'll come to our senses when that time comes. And even worse than having said that is, and I've heard this say by those that have been addicted, they, using their own willpower, can just work themselves out of it. Well, how many in the house know that is a honeydew wagon load of fertilizer? <laughs> Those that know what a honeydew wagon or a honey wagon is get the point. So, I've heard them say that. They can beat the the addiction themselves, and there is no way they can do it without counseling, but they think they can do it without counsel. They think they can do it because they've set their mind to it. But answer me this, will they only wind up a mindless lump of flesh laying on the floor in a drug or alcohol, self-induced emaciated stupor. And once again, I can say I've seen that. The squalor that they live in because they just don't care anything except about the next snort or the next drink or the next joint or the next whatever. 
And the call of that addiction was so strong, they couldn't resist it because they didn't have enough of this in their lives to be able to resist. So what are we going to do? Are we just going to let them pull the wool over our eyes because they think they can play dress up and put on a happy when the whole time the addiction is gnawing at them and they can't get away from it? Do we turn a blind eye to experimentation or condone our children being led around by the nose of those so-called experts that tell them not to listen to their parents because the parents just aren't enlightened today? They're just old-fashioned. They say to our children, our teenagers, our young adults, just fall in line with the new ways, the social media examples, and, and false so-called scientific reports, pseudo or disingenuous science, and society says that evil today is good for you. Is evil good for you? Never. Will evil ever help you? Never. Can you grow good fruit and bad fruit on the same tree? No. Bring forth the good fruit. Do we let them think that they are a different person that's just trapped in this body? Do we allow our children just to do whatever they want to conform to what is being constantly pumped into their minds, into their brains, into their character, trying to turn them into something that God didn't intend them to be? Do we go to our school educators who are doing this horrible work? Do we go to the school boards who, by the way, just don't say anything. They condone it. Why? They don't want to offend anyone. So because they don't want to offend, they go along with whatever comes down the pike, and they don't realize that they are destroying the next generation that's coming along because they don't have the sense. God gave a goose. They are only doing things to go along with what society is trying to dictate. But if you have an eye and an ear for God, you know that all of this stuff is just wrong. It's evil. And the intent behind it is evil. Satan has set this up so well. Satan has done a great job. Remember, his number one trick is deception. He's never, ever, read it from index to maps, he's never changed his tactics at all. Society changes over time. Satan doesn't have to change his tactics. Why? Because they always work on the unregenerated mind. But when that mind becomes regenerated and that mind becomes filled with the word of the Lord and they have the presence of mind to understand that, hey, wait a minute. This isn't right. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. My parents are here for a specific reason. I may not always like what they have to say. Well, that's just too bad. They're your parents. Listen to them. You think you know it all? Just wait. Just wait. You see, we parents have already lived through this. And remember, parents, I'm addressing this to you. You own and run the house, the kids, 
don't. The kids live there because of your grace and your love. That's why the kids are there. You had them to bring them into the world to nurture them, not let society nurture them, but let the parent nurture them to show them the right way and just wait. Wait to that moment that they turn 18 years old and they move out. I can say this from experience. I was 17 when I moved out of the house. And real life planet Earth slaps you in the face because you realize you can't go running home to mommy and daddy anymore. And there's, especially if you move away from home, way far away from home, you can't say, Mom, I need 20 bucks. My gas tank is almost empty. You can't say, can you take me out for dinner? No. No, you think you're a grown-up now. You think you have all the answers. Go for it. Do it. And find out that life is tough. So you keep doing for them what you do because you love them and sometimes you have to get nose to nose, eyeball to eyeball, belly button to belly button and say, look, this is my roof. Look, I pay the bills. I buy the groceries. I work nine to five or whatever your shift may be. Or if you don't work a shift, if you work a farm, from sunlight to sunset and sometimes after sunset, you are working. Kids, you're not doing anything but existing because of my grace. Now, the kids listening to this isn't going to like that. They're not going to like that statement at all. I don't care because they don't rule the house. That's not their roost. Their roost will happen when they get into real life, planet Earth, someplace else, and they have to realize that this isn't as simple as they thought it was when they were living under the wings of mommy and daddy. We realize today that when our kids move out of the house and they run to a different place, that as much as we would like to run after them and help them in every single way that we could possibly help them, that's no longer. They're 18. They think they're adults. It's time for them to leave the nest. We have two bird nests out on our deck. Did we want them there? No. Did we wash them away? No, because there were eggs in there that were going to become little birds. But when those birds leave the nest, phew, we're shooting those nests out of there with water. And if the birds come back, are they welcome? We're going we're gonna to love them. We're going to love them, love them, love them, love them, love them. But are they going to live under my roof for free ever again? Absolutely not. And if they want money, sure, I'll loan you money with interest. You need a hundred bucks, okay? Here's a hundred bucks, but when you pay it back, you owe me a hundred twenty. Well, you sound like a loan shark. No, I sound like a parent. Did that ever happen to you? I'll refrain from that answer, but those of you that know me well enough know how I am. But wait a minute, Psalms 91, we have in the midst of all of this darkness. We have hope in the midst of all of these things that are going on around us. We have hope in the middle of all of the garbage that's trying to be shoved down the throats of our young people, our children, and the young people. And it starts out this one. The one who lives under the protection of the Most High dwells in the shadow 
of the Almighty. You see, we have hope right there, the first line of that psalm. It's right there. It's in your face. Let's look at this. Let's look into this chest of gold that God left for us. Let's in that top and see all of that shines that is gold that is right here that he's left for us and he wants us let's take a sip from the water of life that he's given to us so that we can live because of the things that he wants us to do because the more we sip and we're going to use a personal illustration here. Over the holiday weekend, my lovely wife, Tina, and I were out doing work in the back. And we got baked, boiled, broiled, and grilled. I mean, we were like lobsters right out of the boiler. I, it was, we were just so red. But we loved everything that we did. But... I say that because we didn't take the time for protection. Sure, I wore a hat for a while. I'm bald-headed. Well, of course, I'm going to look like something else, and I won't say. And Tina has a beautiful head of hair, but even that, you can get burned under that. And suddenly... At the end of the day, we look at ourselves, and we are these two lobsters walking around <laughs> thinking, what have we done to our dwelling? What did we do? We had fun. We got everything accomplished on our list. Well, nearly everything. But we didn't take time to protect this dwelling. So verse 1 begins with a very comforting statement. He that dwells in the secret place dwells in the shadow of the Almighty. I'm paraphrasing here, and I'm doing this on purpose, so listen closely. Those that dwell or live or abide in that secret place, and that secret place is the covering of, and that shadow is the intimate place where you live with the Most High. It's that place where you go when it feels like hell is coming up from underneath and the sky is falling on your head and you know you have a way of escape and you go to your secret place and there's solace there. There's comfort there. There's knowledge there that Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear none of this because thou art with me in the middle of it. So we go there into this hiding place, and it actually means a covering as well. So we drape ourselves in his love, mercy, grace, and we can make it through. No, we're not wearing a ghillie suit. We're not out there dressed like a sniper. We are draped in the power of God for such a time as that. And you may ask, how does God have a shadow? Well, remember, this is a, this is a statement that's being made for people to understand. They all saw the eagles that live in the Middle East. They all saw those soaring on the thermals. And they saw how giant those wings were. And when they landed on their nest and it was a hot day, mom and dad would stretch out their wings to cover their children, to keep them cool, to keep them refreshed. Because the parents knew the kids weren't old enough to take it yet. Our loving faith in him connects us with, get this, his loving faith for us. Did you know that God has faith in us? 
Think about it a minute. We, we hear all these messages. You know, you have to have, if you don't have so much faith, you're not going to get healed. If you don't have so much faith, this isn't going to happen. If, you're not, if you don't have this, this much faith, then you're never going to drive a Bentley. Well, who gives a rip? If you never have this much faith, you're not going to have a mansion. I don't care. I don't want one. If you don't have this kind of faith, over and over and over, and the rhetoric becomes almost disgusting. And it makes you want to throw up. But if you're standing there in your resting place, covered under that shadow, man motivated by the devil says, I'm going to find a way through that cover and get to you. And what does God say? <coughs> you want a bet? Come on. Put them up, turkey. You won't last a half a round. We're not going to go 15 rounds like the old days. We're not going to go 12 rounds like today. This isn't going to be um, ultimate fighting. I'm just going to say, you're done. And you're gone. It's easy. God makes it easy. He makes it all easy for us. And all we have to do is call to him. And you know, that also means that we simply sit by his side. We know that Jesus is sitting at his right hand ever making intercession for the saints, but can you imagine having a seat to the throne? Can you imagine sitting next to God Almighty himself and taking off your crown and casting it at his feet? Can you imagine being in that in that seated protection and his wings are outstretched. Why is this place called eagle's wings? Because we are protected by those wings. We are seated there under the protective shadow of El Shaddai, God Almighty. We are protected by LD the God of knowledge. We are there protected by El Roy, the God who sees me. You see, God's got it covered, y'all. He knows what you're going through because he's seen it from the time that he first breathed into Adam. And Adam was just that hunk of clay. And he went, and inflated his lungs with vitality, and man became a living soul. And he knows us from then, and he knows even though we fell, he knows all of those things that try to draw us away from him, that try to pull us away. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and you can tag anything that you go through during the course of your day into those three categories. And then you have to ask yourself why? Especially if you're a believer. There's a there's a 10,000 square foot home. I want it. Oh, wait, 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 back up. There's only two of y'all. Why do you need 10,000 square feet? Because you're supposed to be getting along. So, 2,000 square feet of work. The guy doesn't need 5,000 square feet in this wing, and the wife doesn't need 5,000 square feet in this wing, and they meet maybe for dinner time, and then he goes to his shop and plays with his toys. She goes to her place and plays with whatever she does, and the two never become one because they're so caught up in themselves but we're not called to be caught up in ourselves in verse 2 Jehovah himself becomes our place of safety and refuge he becomes a fortress a fort think about that 
that we can run into. If you have to, think about the old cowboy movies, the old army movies of the old west, where they built these forts all over the place out west. And when things got tough with the Native Americans, the settlers would go into the fort where they could find protection. Now, think of what protection your God can give you when you run into his high tower. What is that protection? It's what we just said. He's all-knowing, all-seeing, all-caring. And he says, come on. I am your Elohim. I am your creator. I know what's going on. And I have a place for you to sit, relax, and just trust me. So wipe that frown off your face because it takes more muscles to frown to smile and put that smile on your face where it's supposed to be in the first place because you can't be in a better place than where you are with me right now. I don't care if Satan has turned the fire up to a billion degrees. It's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace that cranked it up seven times hotter than it had ever been before and the guards that threw them in were completely incinerated and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were just, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Turn your air conditioning down just a little bit. Thank you, Lord. And then all of a sudden, there's a fourth man in that furnace. Oh, my God. And, and the king looks over and he said, hey, yo, didn't we put three folks in there? Well, yeah. Then why do I see four? And oh my, that fourth looks like the sin of God. Oops. Nebuchadnezzar has an oops moment, and he says, shut that fire down. Shut that fire down. Get those guys out of there. And they come out of there, and you think the trial that you're going through is trying to consume you. Think about them. When they came out of that fire, another personal example we bought a smoker. So we smoked a brisket, or not a brisket, um, a pork butt, uh, a, a pork shoulder, if you want to get technical. Um, and every time I had to wa add water to the water pan, the smoke came out and just saturated everything that I had on. So I smelled of smoke. Tina smelled of smoke every time we were around it, even when the smoke was just gently wafting out of the stack. But these guys, when they came out of the furnace, didn't even have that. Not the slightest smell of smoke or a singe on their person. And the king is going, oh my, if your God can protect you from this, what more can he do for you? In verse number three, it provides us with the most elementary way of entrapment by the enemy at the time of the writing of this psalm. As we listen, it's an example of things of that time that were perilous. Now listen. The snare of the fowler. Well, what does that mean? Today we go bird hunting with a shotgun. Back then, if, if they flushed a covey of quail, they threw a net over the top of the covey so they couldn't fly anymore, and the weights on the bottom, it's kind of like fishing was, that the weights on the bottom of the net would take that covey and bring them back down to the ground. They could go get them, and depending on how they wanted to take care of the bird, um, they took care of the bird so they could eat. You see, the devil, the enemy, Slewfoot, I don't care what you want to call him, he's, he's, he's the bad guy that God kicked out of heaven because he got a big head. And then 
There's no way of escape from that. And then it also said, you'll be delivered from the destructive plague. Oh boy, I could go on for hours, but I only have minutes. Um, the supposed pandemic that we have today, and I use that word deliberately, supposed. Yeah, people got sick. Yeah, people died. Yeah, and I'm very sorry about that. My heart goes out to all of those that lost somebody. But you know what? Every year when the annual flu comes around, the same thing happens. But you're forced to get a shot, and then later on scientific studies show us that the shot's going to kill you because the after effects years later are going to affect your body or affect the body of a newborn. Snare of the fowler. Threw a net over the top of you. Gotcha. Verses 4 through 6. He will cover you in a way that nothing else can with his divine protective shield. Think about that for a minute. Last week we talked about Goliath, and his shield was so big, he had to have a separate individual carry that shield. Think about the shield of the almighty, eternal God. Think about the God of the universe and his protective covering that he lays over you. And then it goes on to say, in those verses... Don't be concerned with a terror by night. And he's talking about a thief that breaks into your home. He said, don't worry about him. Number one, it's only stuff. And number two, I got your back. If you want to pull out your shotgun, according to state law, and blow him into the next life, well, that's totally up to you. If you want to take out your revolver and put an end to him, well, that's totally up to you. It's within your rights. But remember, it's only stuff. And you can't take it with you when I come bring you home. So he makes us safe that way. And then he says, don't fear the arrows that fly by day. And he's talking to armies here. So individuals that were in the armed forces within our ranks here at Eagle's Wings, and those of you that are watching, you understand that in the heat of battle, God has his protection over you if you're his son or daughter, and you're not afraid of those arrows because God will grab it in the air, and he won't let it touch you. And trust me, they had rank after rank after rank after rank after rank after rank of archers. And the guy that was in command of the archers would simply say, raise, knock, pull, let fly. Hundreds and thousands of arrows would just course through the sky in an attempt to hit the enemy in a barrage and take him out. But for you, for me, for you, God goes, not today. <laughs> not today. And if they hit my wings, they're going to bounce off like a rubber ball off the sidewalk because you can't touch me. So take that, Satan. During the course of a military engagement, he always makes us safe. And then he goes on to say, don't be afraid of the battle in the middle of the day. This is referring to sunstroke. How many have ever experienced sunstroke or heat exhaustion? Think about Think about our troops that were fighting in, in the Middle East, in, in all the wars, and in Afghanistan, in all of those wars. They were wearing, hopefully it was the good body armor and not, and not the junk that was being sold. They were wearing body armor, 
But when you're wearing all of that extra weight, it wears you out. And then you also have to remember your environment. And in that environment, you need water, right? You can only go so long if you're wearing water and you're carrying a weapon that weighs 10 pounds or better and you're carrying all this ammunition and all this other stuff. You can only go so long. So what do our soldiers do today to help prevent this? And, and, I, and I've talked to some veterans that told me about how they, this is a company, it's called a Camelback, or it's a hydration bladder that they also wear on their back. And it has a hose that comes up this way. And that bladder will hold up to 100 ounces of water. So when they're out there humping the desert, or they're humping the mountains in Afghanistan, or they're humping through the bush in a desert situation, all they have to do is take a sip and take a drink. And they're taught how to drink when they're in boot camp. You don't guzzle it all down because you won't have any for later. But that's the Army, that's the Navy, the Navy, that's the Marines, that's the Coast Guard, that's all those people that come in contact with the enemy. Whether it's the enemy abroad or the enemy within, they are trained to do it in a certain way, and that certain way will preserve their life. Now think about this. This is our water of life. Cheers. Now I can go on for another five miles because I just swish the inside of my mouth. I get that gunk and the dust out of the way and I either spit it out or I swallow it depending on how thirsty I am, but it's just, and I'm good. See, but when you're studying the word you can actually empty, like I said before, that hydration device. Because when you drink from this, it makes you thirsty for more. When you drink from this, it makes you want more. Verses 7 through 10 are quoted probably more often than... After John 3.16, I probably put this in number two. Though a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, the pestilence or destruction will not reach you. We quote that whenever we're in a situation that we think we're surrounded by the enemy, we're never surrounded by the enemy. God's got his hand on us. And he's got his wings spread out. And he's up there going, you think what? You think you're going to get my son? You think you're going to get my daughter? You're not. So we are resting under his shield. And we are walking he becomes our Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, my banner. And we are in his military service. And every time we walk, wherever we go, we carry his banner. And everyone that looks at us knows that there's something different about us. Why? Nothing touches us. And even if it does, it bounces off. Are you going to get sick? You very well may. Is it going to kill you? It very well may. But what's your reward on the other side? What is your ultimate protection? Where is your ultimate dwelling? Where do you ultimately go 
when this flesh draws its last breath and falls on the ground. Into the heavenlies. The ultimate place of protection. So don't worry so much about this clay. It doesn't mean that much. It's simply a vehicle that he's using right now to evangelize the world. And he doesn't hold anything back. And I'm going to say this as a word of caution. All of us as Christians, once we read, study, know, and with situations that come about and we have Attack with the word of God. We don't hold anything back during that attack. We pull our sword. We hold up our shield. And we charge as hard as we can at our enemy. And we hack them down, not with a physical steel sword, but we hack them down with the word of God. All the time under his protective covering. So everything that we do for him, conversely, he is watching over us to make sure that we do it right. So where are you in your dwelling place? Where is your dwelling place? Go ahead and read the rest of Psalms 91. It's a wonderful book. But remember, you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, no matter what you're going through in this physical life. And he's got you. God's got you right here in the hollow of his hand. I want to thank you for being with us today. God bless you all for being here. Thank you for joining us. Um, you may ask, where in the world are you people? Because we have people from all over the world that tune in and watch. And we are at 734 Santa Fe Boulevard in Kokomo, Indiana, USA, if we have to throw that in. Um, and we meet every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And then on Wednesday nights, we have, and if you look behind me, you see this line that says, an unconventional place for an unconventional people. Trust me when I say, we have probably the most unconventional Bible study that you've ever heard of. Because we take, we're studying Proverbs right now, and we may only get through two or three verses, and then we apply it to real-life planet Earth situations in our own lives, and we share the stories and the examples and all that stuff, and we always come back to Proverbs and how applicable it still is today after all those thousands of years after it's been written. So, 10 o'clock, Sunday morning. 734 Santa Fe Boulevard, Kokomo, Indiana. And I imagine the crawler is probably up on the screen. You can contact us via our Facebook page or you can, you can send us um, an email at weareagleswings at gmail.com. Weareagleswings, one word. And we'll get your, your notes and I will read them and answer them. And whatever the question may be, We'll come back to you because we want you to know that we love you and we care. So with that, once again, thank you all for joining. Thanks for being here and making the sacrifice in your time on this Sunday morning. And I know we have a tremendous flesh. Now that we've fed your spirit, we're going to feed your bodies. God bless you. And we know that it's going to be a great time of fellowship together.
Wednesdays at 6 p.m. right here, same place, 734 Santa Fe Boulevard. Now, we want you to have a great week, a wonderful week, a blessed week, on purpose, in Jesus' name. We'll see you next time. Bye.